so, so good to be with you. Love these mornings. Um, I want to start with a very, very quick rescue story with a happy ending. I was about 12 years old. Um, I was out on a walk with my family, and there was this hill there on this walk that led down to this cove, uh, and there was a tidal river there. And when the tide was out, it got very, very, mizzy, very, very muddy down in this cove. And one day, we were out there walking. My gran got stuck in this mud. Um, and she was stuck to the point where she was sinking. And it was one of the moments where, actually, as a 12-year-old boy, at first, it seemed quite funny. But then you realize the seriousness of that situation. The, the solid ground was too far away. There was nothing for her to hold on to. She could not get out. She was stuck, stuck. Now, thankfully, there was a man on the beach, total stranger, who saw what was going on, realized how serious it was, and came to her rescue. He found some wood on the shore. He laid it down on this mud, and he went out to my gran as far as he could, and he lifted her onto this wood and rescued my gran. She had no idea who he was, but she was totally dependent on that man. Now, why on earth am I sharing that story today? Well, it's because at its heart, Every baptism story is a rescue story. Every baptism story is a rescue story. The Bible passage that I felt God wanted me to speak on this morning is Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. It says this, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. But every story is a personal story of being rescued from a pit and placed on a rock. So I just want to talk just in these next few moments about the rock and the rescuer, the rock and the rescuer. First of all, in all these stories, who is the rescuer? Well, the rescuer is Jesus. Each person is being baptized today, and the majority of people in this room have been rescued by Jesus. Now, to understand why we all need a rescuer, we need to understand the depth of the human problem. We have to understand the seriousness of the mess that we're in and just how stuck we are without Jesus. If you ask people today, what is the greatest problem that human beings face? People will give you all kinds of answers. And there may be all kinds of things, problems that human beings face. But the Christian narrative, the Bible story, is that the deeper problem, the greatest problem that human beings have is our own sin. And I know that the word sin is a very Christian-y word. So what does it mean? Well, Francis Spufford describes it like this. He says, sin is the human propensity to, and this is not a very christian word, so let's say muck things up. And it's not just that we muck things up by accident. Actually, it's that the active inclination of human beings is to break stuff, all kinds of stuff. We break promises, we break relationships that we care deeply about, we break ourselves and we break one another. And it all comes out of a broken relationship with our Heavenly Father because of our own sin. We were made by a loving generous, holy God, to love him and to love others, to reflect the kindness and the goodness and the love of God to the world around us. But we don't. We all fall short, and that is all of us. The normal human experience is to muck things up. The Bible says that the thing that is most wrong in you and in me isn't anything around us. It isn't anything that's happened to us. It's something that is in us. It is our sin and it affects everything about us. It affects our imagination and our thoughts and our desires. It affects the way we see ourselves and it affects the way that we connect with and treat other people. And we see the fallout of it right through the Bible. But we also see the, the fallout of it in the narrative of our own lives. I wonder, have you seen that in your own life? Just how destructive you can be to, to yourself as much as to anyone. For all the potential brilliance and beauty of human beings, we are broken. We're in a pit of our own making, full of insecurity and guilt and shame and confusion and hopelessness. We are stuck, stuck. And you know, we can try all kinds of things to fix it, to try and rescue ourselves and pull us out of the pit. But many of us here will know, because we've tried it enough times, that it just doesn't work. We are slaves to our own sin. 
will never grasp the extent of what Jesus has done for us until we realize how stuck we are. But God sees the mess that we're in and he comes to our rescue. And he does it through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God comes as a human being out of love And he lives the perfect life that all of us fail to live, a life of compassion and humility and generosity and selflessness, all out of the security of who he is in the Father. And he shows us what humanity should have been like. And then he goes to the cross because that is what he came to do. And on the cross, the only sinless person who's ever lived is mocked and scorned and tortured and killed. And it is all for us. He takes the punishment for everything that you and I have ever thought and said or done that is wrong. All of it a personal offence to God and all of it paid for by God himself on the cross. That is rescue. Hallelujah. To have our, our slate totally wiped clean. The Lord lifted us out of the pit and placed our feet on a rock. You know, God has always rescued his people. And what we see today is God is still rescuing people today. That's Nadine's story and Ricardo's story and Alistair and Dawn's story and Anouk's story and Jed's story. That God is still rescuing people today. They've been lifted out of a pit and placed on a rock. And what they're about to do in getting baptised is part of their response to that. See, baptism has always been the Christian response to that. In the book of Acts, We read about the birth of the early church. The disciples are there. This big crowd has gathered and Peter gets up to speak. And he's full of the presence of God. And what he says is he ends his preach with this. He says, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And that line, cut to the heart, it literally means to be stabbed or pierced to the heart. It's when a truth grabs hold of us so deeply. It's the, it's the moment when we realise that sin isn't just some abstract concept. Actually, it's personal. It's that my sin nailed Jesus to that cross. Not just the sin of the world, but I did this through my pride and my selfishness and my refusal to submit to God's loving authority. Not just that I've broken God's rules, but that I've broken the Father's heart. I wonder, have you had that moment where you've seen the sin of your own life and you've seen what Jesus has done for you? What do we do when we know that, when we're cut to the heart? Well, Peter says, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the response when you recognise what Jesus has done. It's repent and be baptised. Repent means to turn around, to turn away from your old way of doing things, to acknowledge that you are going in the wrong direction. And be baptised. As those getting baptised in a moment go into the water, they're going to be identifying with Jesus' death on their behalf, saying, Jesus died for me. And as they come back out of the water, they're identifying themselves with Jesus' resurrection, saying they now have new life in him. If you have noticed that Jesus is your saviour, if you recognise that he is your rescuer and you've never been baptised, I would say come and speak to us. We would love to baptise you at the next opportunity. Baptism is a foundational response to what Jesus has done for us. But you know, it's not the end, it's just the start. Because that passage said, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. See, the rescuer is Jesus and the rock is is Jesus. Because when you've been rescued by Jesus, the whole foundation of your life changes. It's not just about what he's rescued us from, it's about what he's rescued us into. He's rescued us into the security and solid ground of a brand new identity as sons and daughters of the most wonderful Father. He's rescued us into new purpose and new works and eternal life. This is so good. He's rescued us into the presence of Jesus Christ himself. He is the rock and he's Lord. See, what you'll notice as we baptise people in a moment is they'll, they'll be asked the same question. They'll be asked this question. Do you confess that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Saviour? It's not just Saviour. It's not just Rescuer. It's Lord. 
To say Jesus is Lord is to have a new king over every area of your life. It's to put him first, to worship Jesus. See, we all worship something. We all have someone or something that we put as first in our lives. We may not have thought of it as worship, but we all have something or someone that we hold as Lord over our lives. How do we find out what that is? Well, Louis Giglio says it's easy. He says, you simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. And at the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what is of highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship. So I wonder, what do you put above everything else in your life? Because Jesus is the only firm foundation. He's the only firm foundation. Ultimately, following him is about obedience. It's a decision to lay down every area of our lives, through our lives, and to say, Jesus, be Lord over this area of my life. To build our lives on the rock of Jesus, to, to grow in obedience to him. So to those getting baptised today, I want to say to you, don't see your baptism as the end goal. This is just the start. If you'll allow him to, he will grow you. He knows your story. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. And he loves you deeply. And as you allow him to be Lord and Saviour, your life in Jesus is going to be a testimony to others. David says, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. See, as you live a life of praise to Jesus, as you make him Lord, what's going to happen is that other people are going to notice. It will be a testimony to others. And people will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Because you're now part of the rescue story. Jesus is calling you not just to be disciples, but to be disciples who make disciples. Jesus said to his followers, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, as I end, what we're doing today, actually, it's all about Jesus. He's the Lord, He's the Savior. He's the rock and he's the rescuer. He's lifted us out of the pit and placed our feet on solid ground. He's given us a new song to sing. That is why we celebrate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's baptize some people.